this is the Flavor of Leadership podcast. I am your host, Clint Hoops. Together, we explore the unique blend of leadership wisdom that helps top leaders consistently achieve work goals, develop personally, and find fulfillment with family. Let's get started. Welcome to episode number 27. When considering your own leadership flavor or style, have you ever seen traits of a tyrant in yourself? I hear the word tyrant just kind of makes you cringe a little bit. Are you a tyrant when you're leading your team? I don't want to be a tyrant. I mean, what do you what do you think of when you hear the word tyrant? You know, I know when I think of the word tyrant, for some reason, I immediately think of an angry pirate captain, right? He's got the eye patch, he's got the peg leg, and and even has a little parrot on his shoulder, right? And I picture him standing there up on the deck, glaring down at all of the other pirates there on the ship, and just demanding that people act now on his orders, or they'll be walking the plank, something similar to that, right? Right. That's, that's what I think of when I think of a tyrant, just this person that just demands everything, just almost just unreasonable and doesn't care about the people around him, just only cares that it gets done. And even though we may not want to be a tyrant or we're not going to be like this pirate, we may be acting like a tyrant, even when we have the very best of intentions. In some cases, especially when we have some of the very best intentions. So. In the book called Multipliers, so the book is called Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter. It was written by Liz Wiseman. I actually referenced it in an earlier podcast. Fantastic book. In the book, she actually goes through and talks a little bit about tyrants versus liberators. Kind of the way she separates a tyrant versus a liberator is she says that a tyrant, they're ones that create a tense environment. She says that this tense environment suppresses people's thinking and their capability. I thought that was interesting, right? So suppresses their ability to even think and actually decreases their capability because of the environment around them, right? Tense environments have stress and anxiety. So you have stress and anxiety makes you can't think clearly, which reduces your capability. She says that people hold back and offer safe and cautious ideas, right? So they avoid making mistakes out of fear. So the environment is so tense, they hold back and offer safe and cautious ideas. And you may be thinking right now, well, tense environment, I don't have a tense environment in my with my team. I'm not creating a tense environment where people have stress and anxiety. But think a little bit more as we go through some of the examples here about what that might actually mean, about what you might actually be doing to create a tense environment where people don't know where they stand. They don't. You may think that you are okay if people make mistakes, but maybe your actions say different. A liberator, on the other hand, they create an intense environment, right? So there's a subtle difference between tense and intense. So a liberator creates an intense environment that requires people's best thinking and work. So Wiseman says that an intense environment requires concentration, diligence, and energy. It is an environment where people are encouraged to think for themselves, but also where people experience a deep obligation to do their best work. I love how she says that. You have to have the concentration, the diligence, and the energy put into the meeting, put into the environment, whatever you're doing, because people are encouraged to think for themselves, not just follow along the way they're supposed to or follow exactly what the leader says every single time. It's an environment that's open, but it is intense. It's a place where good things can happen, where people can learn quickly from mistakes and provide their best ideas since they are not afraid. I know that I've created both those types of environments. Even after learning this, I know I have created both types of these environments. I hope that over the years since I've learned this, that I've actually created fewer tense environments. But being aware of it makes quite a big difference. So she says she provides actually three keys to become a liberator. 
right? She says that if you want to become a liberator and not be a tyrant, here are three ways that will help you to continue to be a liberator. And so if you do these more often and more consistently, it'll help you create a better environment and your people will get it. They'll see that you're trying. And I love these three things. I can vouch for these. I have I have done these and and they have helped so much. So let's let's start with the first one. The first one is play your chips. So I love this. She's she's talking about literally playing your poker chips. And she gives an example of a leader. So this leader that she gives an example of, he was struggling with his team and wasn't he had, you know, some great ideas and his team had some great ideas, but frankly, he was just taking up too much space in the meetings. He was constantly taking every possible opportunity to share his views, and it was kind of smothering everybody else in the room. Have you ever done this? Does this sound familiar to you? Have you done this as the leader? Or have you been in a room where someone else has? It kind of smothers everything, makes it hard, makes it feel like you don't have anything to truly contribute, right? And some of the best ideas that you might have, you may not even offer up because it can create a tense environment. So Wiseman gave this man five poker chips. This is where the chips come in. Five poker chips. One was for 120 seconds that he could talk. So he could spend the chip, so to speak, right? And speak for 120 seconds. But once the chip was played, it was gone, right? He wasn't getting it back. So there were five poker chips. One for 120 seconds, three that were worth 90 seconds, and one that was worth 30 seconds, right? So Wiseman gave this to him, and he accepted the challenge. So he went into these meetings where typically he would be speaking not just for, you know, a mere several minutes, but he would be speaking for a good chunk of the meeting, directing most everything that went on versus allowing some of the people who were supposed to be leading the meeting to lead the meeting and, and let the whole group's ideas come. So what happened during this meeting? He held to his poker chips and found that his people began to see that see him as a better leader. The more he began to do this over time, he was creating space for his people. And he was using, I love the term that she used, leadership restraint. Leadership restraint. So he was using leadership restraint to be able to not smother everyone else in the room and allow the great ideas of others to come through instead of constantly putting his own spin on everything and his own opinion on everything that was brought up. I've done the same thing, actually. I found that it helped me as well. I mean, I didn't have poker chips necessarily, but I, before the meeting started, I did this with myself. I said, okay, I'm going to commit that I'm going to make three comments, no more than three comments during this meeting, you know, somebody else's meeting, and I'm going to make no more than three comments of a minute each or something like that, and kept it pretty simple and held myself to that, and it was amazing. You know, if I had already kind of spent, I remember some of the times I tried it, if I'd already spent all my chips and people would would kind of ask me a question, I would end up in, in, in order, kind of in the spirit of it, I would I would try to ask a question in return and hear somebody else's ideas <laughs> instead to try to put a different little spin on it and, and to help get other people to talk. And it was amazing how much it helped to the point where I've actually had a few people that kind of commented how much they appreciated, you know, the way that the meeting went. And, and how much better some of the meetings went when I didn't, you know, take over thinking, oh, well, me as the leader, I have, I have all the great ideas. So I need to make sure everyone hears them. Every time I have a good idea, oh, need to put in my two cents. So something wise worth doing, try playing your chips, giving yourself and use some leadership restraint. Number two, this is an important one, label your opinions. So she gives an example, actually, about, about labeling your opinions. Because this has actually happened to me. And the example that she gave in the book was actually very similar to something that happened to me. And, and so I'm going to share you my example about labeling your opinions. So I once visited one of our branch offices. And someone had asked me for my opinion on, on something that seemed pretty small. To, to be honest with you, I don't even actually remember what it was that they asked for my opinion on. But I gave my opinion, right? They, it was, it was just kind of in passing. And I said, oh yeah, well, I'd, I'd probably do X and something small. And I just kept moving on. No big deal. But 
what happened when I gave this opinion without even thinking, it ended up starting a chain reaction that I didn't even see. I left the office, no big deal, went back to my office. And then the next week, I actually received a phone call from the executive director that leads that branch. And that executive director was calling because he wanted to clarify with me the policy change that I had made when I came to the branch. <laughs> and I was thinking, what policy change did I make? Because, because you know, I wouldn't typically make a policy change like that. And if there was a policy change to be made, it would be done through the executive directors, and then they would disperse that to their team. So in the end, that which kind of took the, the executive director back because that wasn't the usual way we would do it. And so I was confused when he said, you know, that I had enacted this policy change and he wanted some clarification. And he went on to kind of explain a little bit more, and he and he mentioned one of his managers that had told him about this, and then it dawned on me as he was talking when he said that manager's name, it all of a sudden dawned on me, I'm like, oh my goodness, that manager had actually asked my opinion on this simple thing, and quickly it had become policy, and it had actually been even tweaked a little bit, like what I had said, they had they must have talked about it and said, oh yeah, this is this is this is a perfect idea, and the CEO he agrees with this, so we're going to put this into place immediately, and wow, like I said, I don't even recall exactly what it was about. But all I remember is the lesson. And I have been so much more careful over the years that have followed to make sure that I always label my opinions as a leader so people know what they truly are. Are they policy or are they simply a, 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 an opinion that hasn't been well thought out? Wiseman actually goes on to say she calls them soft versus hard opinions. And so Soft opinions are exactly what I gave the person at this branch office. They had asked my opinion on something and I gave them a soft opinion, but I didn't label it. I didn't tell them that was a soft opinion. I should have told them, hey, this is really just kind of my first thought as I go through this, but you should consider it more, da, 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 you know, whatever it made sense for that specific case to make sure they knew that this was not a policy change. This was not my hard, fast opinion. I hadn't even thought about it much before versus a hard opinion, which is, oh no, this is set in stone. This is something that is clearly what needs to happen. Or if it's just an opinion, once again, this is truly what I believe. I have researched this. This is what I believe. And so labeling those opinions will make all the difference to the people that are listening. Once again, helping you become a liberator, helping people not feel bound to each thing you say, giving them permission to disagree with you. In some organizations, that's not that's not appropriate. You can't disagree with the leader. And so you want to create a place where it's okay to have conversations that are open and where it's okay for leaders and everyone around to give their opinions and then come up with the best decision as a group. And then the leader will make the final decision if it was theirs to be made. And so that's okay. But it gives an open forum for people to be able, where it's safe to be able to make those opinions. Number three is make your mistakes known. So this one's often difficult for, for many of us, especially as a leader, if you, you pride yourself on being one who is competent and, and knows the answers to problems, you've been around the block, you have a lot of experience. Sometimes it's hard to share your mistakes, either present mistakes or mistakes that you made long ago. But these stories can help give people permission to make mistakes and learn from them without fear in their own jobs. People need to know that you didn't get to where you are as a leader without making a few mistakes along the way and without learning from those mistakes. Wiseman, she, she talks about, you know, having, you know, doing either personal or public on sharing and making your mistakes known. You know, sometimes the appropriate place is just a little one-on-one -on -one meeting with someone where you're able to share some of your examples of the past, where maybe you made some mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Other times it might be more public in a, in a full meeting where you're saying, hey, these are the mistakes that I made. She gave an example of a company who every week during, during one of their meetings, they would talk about all of the big, big mistakes and big whoopses basically that happened during the last week. And they would kind of celebrate those together and, and talk about what they learned. And so depending on your type of company and what you're doing, you can share those. But those are all ways that you as a leader can also be vulnerable with sharing and making your mistakes known. So the three different keys to becoming a liberator are 
that she gave some examples are play your chips, label your opinions, and make your mistakes known. I know that when you have consistency in those areas, on these three simple things, it will truly help you become more of a liberator where you have an intense environment where things are expected to be done and performance is expected, but yet a not a tense environment where your people are worried that you're going to make them walk the plank when they mess up, where they're always playing it safe because they're too afraid to mess up. So let's seek to become liberators to our people that we lead. So here's the challenge for this week. Take one of these three ideas and use it during the next week with your team. Or heck, try using all three. It wouldn't be too hard and it will make a difference to you. You got this. Until next week. Thanks for joining me on this week's episode of the Flavor of Leadership podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please share it with a friend. And if you haven't already, subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcast player. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback for us, you can reach me directly at flavoroflidership.com. Thanks for listening.